Good morning, everyone. Thanks for coming today. We're going to be talking about the Florida Buyer Brokerage Agreement. All right. All right. So um, now that we are um, approaching mid-September, hopefully all of you are at least um, you know somewhat familiar with some of the new forms that have resulted from the NAR settlement. Um, the two, well, I guess three major changes are um, number one, that there is no compensation um, notified in MLS. It's com completely taken out of MLS, as I'm sure everybody knows that. The second thing is that every potential buyer has to sign some form, some sort of buyer brokerage agreement. It could be a showing agreement or an actual buyer brokerage agreement before they even look at property with you. So that's the second thing. And these are all rules state by state. It's national rules. The third is that there has to be a separate form that's a compensation agreement between um, the the seller's broker or the seller and the buyer's broker if there is compensation being offered from the other side. So those are the three things. Um, so if you are representing a buyer, um, you know, before you even think about submitting a purchase contract, before that's even on your radar, you need to get a buyer brokerage agreement signed. So some of the new documents that have emerged from this whole NAR change um, are these six. Now, I believe there were two that were just released, I think a couple days ago, you probably received an email from your MLS. Um, and I think they were just like addendums or um, just like amendments. Um, so those have been added uh, to your dot loop. So they are there. If you have any questions about that, please call support. They know about it so they can help you with that as well. <clears throat> so something that's really important to understand uh, with all of these forms is the types of agency, because there are different types of ways you can represent a buyer. So different types of agency. Um, so the first type is single agent, and this is going to be the preferred uh, highest form of representation you are only representing that client. So um, in this transaction, in a transa transaction. So, um, you know, we have some of the descriptions for that here, um, you know, dealing honestly and fairly, loyalty, confidentiality, obedience, full disclosure, um, all of those things. And then we have a transaction broker. And it's similar to a single agent in that you do owe... Um, some responsibilities. Um, and then we also have no brokerage relationship in which you're essentially just a facilitator. And there are three different buyer broker forms, the single agent, transition to transaction broker, um, and then the non-brokerage. And that's all in your dot loop for you to use. So you would be a transaction broker mainly if you are in a situation where you'll be representing the seller and the buyer. And <clears throat> if you are a single agent, either for the buyer or the seller, so again, and the other side um, is also a Dalton, so like say it's a Dalton Wade listing, you're representing the buyer. Um, so we have two Dalton Wade agents possibly entering the same, you know, a transaction on the same property. Both sides need to transition to a transaction broker. Um, and again, if you have any questions about this, feel free to call support. So August 17th, that's when all of the changes happened. We also have a compensation disclosure that is solely to be used on all um, transactions that began before August 17th. So this could still apply for some of you. So um, whether it's a listing or you're representing a buyer, you need to get this signed for all of those transactions and have them in your dot loop before you submit them to compliance or they won't be, um, you'll, you'll just get it back and you have, you'll have to add it. So really important that you guys get this signed. 
So one of the ways you can enter into an agreement with a buyer before looking at property is with the property pre-touring agreement. Now, this is less hefty than the buyer brokerage agreement. If you have a client who is has some cold feet, they're kind of, I don't know, up in the air, not really comfortable with all the new changes, which seems to be somewhat common right now. Um, it's always easier to just start with the pre-touring agreement in which it just protects you um, during the time that you're showing property to them. Um, I do want to add, though, that for all of the people out there that are looking to buy a house, all of these new changes are new for them, too, right? So for those of you who have been, you know, running into potential buyers who are not wanting to sign a buyer brokerage agreement, you got to remember that no matter where where they go or who they work with, they're going to have to sign one. So they're going to learn, <laughs> you know, so don't feel like you're trying to sell it to them because this is a rule that every single real estate agent has to follow. So for the property pre touring agreement in the first blank, you're going to write Dalton Wade Inc. In the second blank, you're going to write your client's name. Then you're going to write the number of days that you'll be contracted by these consumers to view property. For the broker compensation, if these clients decide to submit an offer on a property that you showed them, they will owe you compensation and you're going to check which one applies. Um, option one, you're going to fill in the blank with a flat fee dollar amount, which will be due at the time of closing. Option two, you're going to fill in a percentage of the purchase price plus any other amount that will be due at closing. Option three will be any other arrangement. And so I do want to make note, one of the biggest uh, mistakes that we're seeing in these contracts right now is that um, some of you are checking off the first and the second box. Don't do that. So it's either going to be the first box or it's going to be the second box or it's going to be the third box. So if you are if you're doing a flat fee and some percent of the purchase price or something, just check other and then write that arrangement in the blank. I hope that makes sense. Um, so your compensation may be reduced if a seller or a listing broker agrees to pay you some or all of what you are agreeing to with the buyer. So if you um you know, whatever commission you guys decide on, if the selling side decides you to offer half of it, then your buyer only has to pay you half, for example. Um, and a note, this is a national, one of the national rules now that have just come out. The broker compensation will never exceed the amount agreed upon in writing between the buyer and you. So this is very important. So the opposing sides offer of compensation can never exceed what you've agreed upon with your buyer. Okay. We also have a showing agreement. Now, uh, Florida has a lot of, a lot of forms um, when compared to a lot of the other states and it, <clears throat> I'm sure it gets a little confusing. So the showing agreement is an older document, whereas the property pre-touring agreement is one of the documents that's newer that's resulted from the NAR settlement. The showing the pre property pre-touring agreement protects you from um, it protects you so that any property you view with this client, your any of those properties are protected. So that means that. You know, if they write an offer on any of the properties you guys go look at, like they're working with you. For the showing agreement, the, if you can see on the second blank that it only protects, protects you against specific properties, <clears throat> which you have to actually list in number two. So, um, <clears throat> you know, if you're if you're comfortable with the showing agreement, you prefer it, that's totally fine. It seems to me that the property pre-touring agreement might be a little bit more broad. All right, and then we have the beginning of the buyer brokerage agreement. So these section one is the party section. You're gonna write your client's full name in the first space and the brokerage name in the second blank space.
Let me just quickly check the chat. Uh, Kevin says in the listing agreement, it's spelled out that the seller compensation to the buyer's broker, do you also need another form filled out? That form is not loaded in dot loop. Hi, Kevin. Okay, so yes, you do. It You need a compensation agreement. And the form is in dot loop. It's under new forms. When you go to your templates, it's under new forms. There's the different, the two different types of compensation agreement. There's one that's seller to buyer's broker and one that's buyer's broker, or I'm sorry, seller's broker to buyer's broker. So they are there. And if you need help finding them, you can just call support. Alrighty. So section two, we have the term. So in the first and second blank, you'll enter the day, month, and the year of the start of this agreement. And in the next two blanks, you'll enter the end date for the this agreement. If the buyer finds a property during this agreement, it will be extended until that transaction closes. Section three is the property. So in A, you'll describe the type of property your client is looking for. And B, you will write the locations that your client is interested in living. Section four covers the broker's obligations. So as the broker, you must use your professional skills to help your client locate and view properties that match their search criteria, schedule showings, and fulfill the requirements of any subsequent transaction. Your client must understand that you might work with other buyers who are interested in the same properties they're looking at. If you submit offers on the same home for more than one client, you must notify them that a competing offer was submitted, but disclose no other details unless given written consent. The client needs to understand that if you are compensated by a seller or a seller's agent, that doesn't mean that your duties to them are compromised in any way. For fair housing, C. So as the broker, you need to follow all the principles and the laws for the Fair Housing Act. And the broker cannot guarantee that any of the services provided by anybody recommended to the consumer in connection with a property um, that they're interested in. So if you were to recommend a home inspector to them or um, a financial advisor or anything, that does not mean that you are guaranteeing their services. Number five, consumer obligation. The client agrees to cooperate with you in accomplishing these goals. Refer. They will refer all inquiries and communications from other brokers and consumers related to their property searches to you as their broker. All negotiations and communication efforts for this property search must be made through you. Providing their broker, lender, closing agent, etc. with accurate information to acquire a property. They must also authorize a credit check to be run on them to verify their buying potential. They will meet with you at reasonable times for property viewing and indemnify you from all losses, damages, and costs of any kind that occur while you're acting on their behalf to find a property. Um, and they will not request any form of discrimination in relation to acquiring a property. And they will consult with specialized professionals when appropriate. They will also make a good faith effort to meet the terms of a purchase agreement or contract to lease when a property is found. Number six is the retainer. In this blank, you'll write the non-refundable retainer fee that the client will pay upon execution of this contract. This will be in addition to any commission earned by the broker. And this is optional. You don't have to do a retainer fee, totally optional. Uh, number seven, compensation. Compensation is earned when a property meeting the requirements of the client is found and a contract is entered to acquire the property. The commission received by the broker from the transaction to purchase a property can reduce the amount owed by the client as laid out here. A is purchase or exchange. So enter here either a dollar amount or a percentage of the purchase price which will be owed to you once your client finds and purchases a property or leases a property. C, um, the same, uh, so let's see, oh, I'm sorry, B is the same for a purchase or a lease. Um, 
And then compensation will be owed for all other types of property acquisitions, purchases, or exchanges. And then if there are any additional fees, you can list them at the bottom of seven at E. Number eight is the protection period. So if within a certain amount of days after the termination of this contract, your client enters into a purchase contract on a property you found for them during the time of this contract, um, you will you would be owed um, your compensation. So the default is 30 days, but if there's any other amount of time you'd like, you can add that there in the blank. Number nine is conditional termination. The broker can conditionally terminate this contract if requested. Enter the blank for any agreed upon cancellation fee that would apply under this circumstance. And dispute resolution. So mediation must first be attempted to solve any disputes arising out of this agreement. If litigation ensues, the prevailing party can recover their attorney's fees and costs from the other party unless both parties agree to neutral and binding arbitration. And then there must be um, initials by the broker and the consumer. Under arbitration, both parties will pay their own attorney's fees and will split the arbitrator's fees equally. Number 11 is assignment persons bound. The broker can assign this agreement to another broker, and this contract is bound to the clients, the brokers, their heirs, successors, and representatives. All right, so um, the first two pages of the buyer broker agreement is the same no matter what type of agency you're going to be working under. And so I'm going to go over the three different um, third page options. So this is the third page for the exclusive buyer brokerage agreement. So number 12, brokerage relationship. The broker is a transaction broker in this transaction and must perform these duties. Um, and then number 13, other terms. So always consult with your managing broker or a lawyer on the verbiage to be used here. In general, we advise that this section should be left blank. Number 14 is acknowledgement and modifications. The client or consumer understands that this agreement and all its contents and changes can only be made by a written and signed agreement by both parties. It's important to re remember that brokerage fees are negotiable and the broker cannot receive compensation that exceeds the amount agreed upon with their client. This is page three of the single agency agreement. So as a reminder, the first two pages are the same. Number 12, so under the single agency agreement, the broker and their associates owe these duties and they're, they're listed here. A single agent is defined by Florida statutes as a broker who represents either the buyer or seller of real estate, but not both in the same transaction. It is the highest form, providing the most confidence to the customer that the realtor represents only the customer's interest. A transaction broker is defined as a broker who provides limited representation to a buyer, a seller, or both in a real estate transaction, but does not represent either in a fiduciary capacity. <clears throat> so the main difference between the two, um, as far as duties, is that the transaction broker relationship lacks these four things, but all of them are present in a single agency relationship. So that would be loyalty, confidentiality, obedience, and full disclosure. Now, this is going to be page three of the transition to transaction broker agreement. So this contract will be used if, your, if you and your client agree that you may represent both parties to a transaction and would then be transitioning from a single agency relationship to a transaction broker. Under this type of limited representation, there is limited confidentiality, which may prevent you as the real estate agent from disclosing to the buyer that the seller will accept a price less than asking and from disclosing to the seller that the buyer will pay a price that's been greater than what's submitted. Essentially, nothing can be disclosed to either party unless agreed upon in writing. 
Under this agreement, the buyer and the seller are giving up their rights to undivided loyalty from their broker. As the broker will simply be a facilitator of this transaction and will not represent one party to the detriment of the other. So if you are a single agent and your client is interested in a Dalton Wade uh, listing, you need to transition to transaction broker at the time of showing, okay? And now here we have the compensation agreement, which is the seller to the buyer's broker. So um, it's pretty simple. Um, and then you know, I just wanted to go over number four, which is the buyer's broker compensation. So just like um, the compensation that's laid out everywhere now, you have three different options. Um, you have either a flat fee, which will be the first check, or you can do a percent of the gross purchase price. Um, and then if there's any added on fee, there's a blank for that there. Or any other arrangement in which you can write out in the third check. And then this is going to be exactly the same, except it's a compensation agreement between the seller's broker to the buyer's broker. And some notes about compliance. Um, NAR is going to be relying on all of the MLSs to ensure compliance with the buyer broker agreement. MLS will request from the agent their buyer broker agreement or pre-touring property agreement. And if you don't have one, you will be fined. They're very significant um, and they vary from MLS to MLS. Um, and then, you know, again, we have a compliance team, so, you know, you should be good to go. But if the buyer broker agreement is incorrect and MLS happens to ask for it from you, the brokerage will be fined. The only buyer broker form allowed for compliance is the Florida Realtors buyer broker forms. And please don't forget the compensation agreement. So some of the different uh, ways that you can present your value as a buyer's agent, because before, um, you know, if you were primarily working with buyers because they didn't pay, they weren't the ones to pay you. Um, you know, you didn't necessarily have to get into deep conversations about, you know, why you're a valuable real estate agent. So something that you guys will have to all practice on and kind of develop a little bit of like an elevator pitch, um, you know, a very um, easy to understand laid out way of explaining to people why you provide value to them. Um, so obviously your experience, you know, if you're an experienced agent, that's going to be the number one thing. You can kind of go over the process of buying a house to them. So they understand that, you know, you're really doing a lot for them. You're going to be showing them as many houses as needed. You have a full understanding of the market and what represents value in a home so that they won't be overpaying. You have a detailed understanding of the purchase contract, every line, every section, every paragraph. Um, you're going to ensure that all important dates are adhered to. You're going to be present at the home inspection and you will help them to negotiate if needed with the contract. You're going to follow up with the lender, title insurance, et cetera. You will review the title commitment with them. You will be there for the final walkthrough. And you will review the settlement statement to ensure your buyer understands all the charges and expenses. So this is a lot. You guys do a lot for your, for your clients, right? So just make sure that, you know, you've got this little list for yourself. And before you talk to someone, you can be confident knowing that, you know, you really do a lot for them. Um, and then this is from Phil. So just some strategies to ensure that your buyer signs an agreement. Um, obviously, it's going to be easier with someone referred to you than someone that you met online. Um, and then just explain that this is a new requirement. All buyers have to sign it when working with a real estate agent. We also have a buyer consultation package on our Join Dalton Wade website. And the link for that is right here, but you can also just find it on our website. Um, and then explain your value. 
And then if they're still feeling weird or they're, you know, maybe not fully understanding, um, you can always just suggest starting with a property pre-touring agreement. So some other considerations um, for listing agents, if you are offering a buyer's compensation, the suggestion is to have the compensation agreement signed by Dalton Wade prior to the offer. If the existing listing after implementation date in your MLS um, or new listing after implement implementation date, you want to have that compensation agreement signed by Dalton Wade in advance. So if you're conducting an open house for another Dalton Wade agent and an open house visitor wants to write an offer, remember that you have to obtain a written buyer broker agreement before the purchase contract is written. And um, also remember that if you're sitting in open house for another Dalton Wade agent, you would then be a transaction broker. That's all I have for you today, guys. I do also just wanted to mention that I see a lot of chatter online about people sort of disagreeing about who should be presenting the compensation form. Should it be the listing agents, which is what MLS is, is recommending that that um, the listing agents have these compensation agreements signed. So if your seller is prepared to offer compensation and you're the listing agent, just have your seller sign a compensation agreement that you can present to the buyer's agent. Hey, this is what we're offering. Some agents are asking buyer's agents to bring them a compensation agreement. They want to see what the buyer's what the buyer's broker is asking for. So two different strategies with this. A lot of people are disagreeing on what's best. I think as these NAR changes take root and all of you guys start working with them, we're going to see kind of what best practices are. But it does, in my mind, seem like it is a lot easier if the seller or the listing agent just has it signed ahead of time. So really totally up to you and your clients and what they want to do. Um, are there any questions, guys? I'm actually going to uh, stop the recording so that I can get this sent off to you guys pretty quickly.